Hello and welcome to the Supercoach Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Savage, and I'm joined today for episode 173 or 174. I'm not sure where I'm at at the moment, but I'm joined here by a big Supercoach super personality in the Supercoach world, Glenn Fisher. How are you, Glenn? Yeah, good, mate. Yourself? It's pretty good. Uh, it's been a long time, and this is the first time you've come, come on our podcast. Um, what's life been like lately? Yeah, actually, life for me has been really good lately. Like the last 12 months, I'm just flying, man. It's been really good. Supercoach is how I know you. Uh, you're part of the Supercoach Tragic page. How did that come about? And uh, like, s- tell me about your Supercoach journey. So um, it came about by the, um, we were in Fanatics together, you and me, remember? Yep. And um, I one day decided I was going to create my own. And um, everyone followed me. The whole admin team, as you know, followed over. So it yeah. became all 10 of us joined um, the Tragics. And uh, yeah, with my super coach, um, I've done pretty well, as you know. I've um, 76, uh, 92, I think. I've had a lot of um, top thousands, but the last two years have been shockers. I've had 11,000 and 19,000. So uh, to be fair, this year, I've been distracted. I've had a lot going on this year. That are in BBL as well. I've done really well, as you know. I have top 300 the last five years. My son's been top 100 every year. Like, it's been incredible. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that. Your family is a bit of a super coach. Yeah, the ninth in BBL. Well. Yeah. Ninth in BBL. And I remember ninth in NRL. Ninth yeah. in NRL. Your, yeah. your son, Tyrone. Yeah, I was 13, and then I dropped to uh, 600 with two rounds to go. I made this stupid decision to get rid of Latrell Mitchell and Tedesco when they were playing for the Roosters because I knew everyone above uh, me had the same. So I was trying to find a way into the top 10, and all mm. I did was found my way out of the top 100. <laughs> was that the same year Tyrone got ninth? No, the year I got 76, Ty got ninth. The year that I got that happened, you were actually down there with me. I don't know if you recall, and then you just blew out as well. You went boom, boom, and you're around 2K. But you you and I were top 100 for the... Like I was top 100 the whole year. I was in the top 20 for most of was the year. Was this a while back? Oh, it's a while back, yeah. So 2017, yeah, around I would say. Yeah, yeah. I actually no. finished, I think... 110th that year? Yeah, no, it wasn't that year. This year you blew out. You actually blew yeah, out. Yeah. I blew out a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, Super Coach, uh, you've been doing it for a long time, be part of all the pages. What, why did, like, you said you wanted to make your own page in uh, going from Fanatics. Why, why was that? Because the market was pretty saturated as it was. I just felt like I was doing a lot for everyone else. Yeah, I was writing yeah. a lot of stuff. As you know, I write a lot of stats. I was doing a lot of write-ups, and I was doing them for everyone else's page. And I thought, well, why not just do this for myself, you know? And plus, I wanted to create an atmosphere similar to you. I have no DH policy, you know, no D heads. I just don't like that stuff. Yeah. So I've made a page where I just feel like it's super friendly, We've and it's grown really well, as you know. That's what everyone says, though, but it ends up becoming so toxic. In, I know. In, so it's very hard to police, and you, uh, you have kept it... Yeah. Quite like I, I see you in some inboxes saying, "Look at this dickhead. Look, we're yeah, going to yeah. boot him," and everyone else is like, "Oh, we'll just leave it." But they're they're just so used to all the dickheads already yeah. in the all the pages all the anyway. Pages, yeah. So um, your standards are pretty good there. Um, but obviously, you said you've got a lot going on off the field, uh, off the super coach field, and that's why I wanted John. You got, you got a pretty interesting story. You have a book. I do. I wrote a book called Predator's Paradise about growing up on the streets and in institutions. And uh, as you know, well, I told you I was a heroin addict 35 years. So um, the last 10 years I've been rebuilding my life and the last 12 it's just elevated. I haven't heard the full story. So so where did it start? And yeah, so if you want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm is. happy <laughs> to be, Brandon. That's what it's about, getting to know who I am. And I mean, I have a powerful story. It's a big story. Um, I won't share the whole thing because it's big. But yeah, because we can push people onto that book right yeah yeah that's <laughs> right well yeah i wrote the book about my story and so basically like my dad went to jail when i was very young the mm. age of seven um, my mum was schizophrenic she had alcoholism and addiction in her core and my dad was also a violent alcoholic uh so i got put into institutions at the age of seven i was the oldest of four and um what ends up happening is i get out a couple of years later i go through some real heinous abuse uh, sexual abuse and some uh, physical abuse it was just really um bad I end up going into boys' homes and I go through a whole lot of institutions, foster care. And uh, what ends up happening at the age of 14, my parents dump me. I've got nowhere to go, literally nowhere to go. And I end up living on the streets of King's Cross. And, um, and as I've said before, I got put into a refuge that was run by five men that were actually pedophiles. Yeah. Uh, I had a girlfriend. She was 15. She was murdered. And um, oh. that, yeah, a lot went bad for me, bro. And I, and I couldn't handle it. And after her death, I remember going to these men and I said, one day I'm going to write a book. I said, I'm going to tell the world what you did. And I said, one day I'm going to hold you all accountable. 
And uh, he laughed at me, Brandon. He laughed in my face and he said, mate, you're a heroin addict. You'll be dead by the age of 21. And I was illiterate, bro. He said, you're illiterate. You can't write, read and write. How are you going to write a fucking book, you know? Oh, sorry for the swearing. How are you um, going to write a book? That's bloody or, oh, fucking all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right. no worries. Yeah, but um, so what ends up happening is uh, I, I'm a heroin addict, you know, and for the next 35 years I'm a heroin addict. I go to jail for armed robbery. I'm charged with pretty heavy crimes, you know, extortion, demand money with menaces, assault and robberies, armed robberies. I've got a whole lot of crimes going on, but the one that puts me in jail is armed robbery. And I uh, do a bit of time in prison. I get out of prison, but I'm back into it. I'm on methadone. I'm on heroin. I'm just... Um, and then I go through this thing called the Woodraw Commission against the corruption in King's Cross and um, where nine police officers take their life, a judge, the judge that let the killers of my girlfriend go, who was also a predator, uh, takes his own life. And, um, and then I go through another Royal Commission, which is called the Royal Commission in the Institutional Abuse. And then I go through four separate trials against four of my abusers and I put all four of them in jail and, and I wrote my book. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I didn't know it was that heavy. Yeah, it was heavy, bro. Like, I, I lost so many of my friends, Brandon. I, I've seen more people die than I can name in the alphabet, bro, and it's pretty yeah. sad. You know, it's um, I, I, I had a rough childhood, bro, but I've turned around. As you know, I've got five amazing children, yeah. five amazing grandkids, and uh, 10 years ago, I stopped. I, I, I overdosed. Like, I tried to take my life, Brandon, twice, uh, really serious attempts. And uh, But I ended up putting it all down. Uh, in 2010, I stopped using but I was still on a program. Yeah. And uh, uh, the last of my persons I did in a current affair interview, as you know, a year ago, and the last guy got, got, got a 10 year sentence. And, uh, and then I started coming off all the medications as well. And I've done that now about 109 days, I think. And um, yeah, and now I run a program on the streets where I go to the streets and I'm working with homeless and I'm helping people on the streets through addiction, trauma. And, and like I take them gift cards and food and clothing and just try and turn people, um, show them there's a way out, bro. Yeah, that's a pretty big comeback for yourself. Like, no. per personally, myself, I haven't been through shit compared to yeah. what you have. So, like, the fact that you bounce back, not many people can do that. Yeah, and sadly, mate, most of my friends have either died um, to overdoses, liver disease, uh, are in jail for the rest of their life. Like, I've got a lot of mates that are actually won't ever get out of jail or doing yeah. long t stints in jail. And um, I, I just... I don't know, something in me never gives up, bro. And I like, even when I was in jail, right, I spent every moment in jail learning my school certificate. I did what's called a general certificate uh, of education so I could write my book. And yeah. I, was, I was writing, reading, writing, and the whole. And once I got out, I started writing, you know. And um, it's the proudest thing I ever did, bro, is I, like not just writing the book and publishing it, but holding these people accountable, like I said. And there's a part to my journey, like so my girlfriend was uh, murdered when I was 15, right? Um, she was my first girlfriend I ever had. And the killers of her were convicted. They got 20 years jail. But what happened was they appealed and they went for a judge who's also a pedophile who um, set them all free, bro, and then took his own life. And uh, so I could never turn that result around. Mm. But um, next Friday or next week sometime, I'm going to her grave. I've never done it since the day she died. And to say, to say I did it, I told you I'd do it and I, I did it. So, so this is like a full circle journey that Absolutely. feels like it's just about com complete? It is, bro. I, I'm, mate, I'm, I'm thriving, bro. I'm doing the best I've ever did. I'm going to the gym. I'm working with people on the streets. I've got people in my life. I'm so happy. I've got, I just had a beautiful birthday for three days with my children. It was just, everything's going really well for me at the moment. How do you speak about it so openly? Like, like I've seen you speak about it so openly for so long. Yeah. It's but it's just like, like some people can't deal with that. So being honest with you, I called it my dirty little secret and I held it in my life for many years, bro. Yeah. I could not talk about it. But that not talking about it is the reason I was using drugs. The reason I was using was I used to think my problem was addiction. If I just stop using, I'll be fine. Yeah. The problem was that's not how it plays out. What happens is that I realize there's an underly, underlying trauma. I have depression. I have PTSD. I'm mindful that I have those things now. I'm conscious to treat those things. And once I started treating those things, mate, my life started to to work in the right direction and being honest i've just one thing i am now brandon is completely transparent and honest mm. about my story and you know what the people that care about me will care about me and the people that don't accept that's who i am don't you know I, i'm no longer trying to worry about what other people think about me it's very interesting so the, all, all this is in your book yes like, absolutely is it from a first person perspective or yeah yeah so i've written a story about my childhood oh. Oh, uh, yeah. So oh, my shit, they brought the book. You had a media <laughs> day today, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, so I did a story with Channel 7. So I did a documentary about the cross. Uh, they're doing a story called The Rise and Fall of King's Cross. Um, yeah, so... That's nice. 
Yeah, right. they they do. So I, I did an interview today with uh, Channel Seven. Yep. I also did a current affair interview. I've done a stack of stuff, man, and um, around my story, been in the papers, as you know, and uh, now I run that stuff on TikTok. I have a huge following on TikTok that follows me, and I'm inspiring people. You know, I got like, I'm just gonna be honest with you, right? For ten years, Brandon, the time you knew me, right, through Supercoach, I was really struggling, man. I never left my house ever. The reason I was able to be present on all them things every single day was because I never left my lounge room. And I'm like literally, I'm talking about literally, never mm. left my lounge room. Other than to get food, that was it. My house, bro, it was fucked. It was filthy as a house could pro- possibly be. Yeah. And so was my head. But once I started to realise that this trauma needs dealing with and, and being like straight with you, Stop feeling sorry for myself, bro. Yeah. When I thought, you know what? No one's going to go right through the door and save me, bro. I've got to do this. And I, and I did. And in the last 12 months, man, I've been going to the gym. I've been going out doing active stuff on the streets. I've been meeting people, bro, and eating right and cleaning my house. Like, simple little things. Yeah. Did you, did you like, speak to someone to get yourself out of that sort of state? Or was it just like a light bulb moment? It was kind of like I started sharing my book, right, on TikTok. It's where it started. And I, I didn't expect the following I would get. Yeah. So many people, bro, were just reaching out to me and they're saying, oh, bro, I'm stuck on a lounge, bro. I'm stuck in addiction. I'm suffering with trauma. I went through this, but I can't share it. And the more I did it, the more people were reaching out to me. And as you saw, one, two, three, four, and it got up to 12,000 people following mm. me. Incredible, you know, like, and... And uh, it was a light bulb moment for myself. You know, the counsellors never worked for me, bro. I, the only person that can save me, and I've worked it out, was myself. Yeah, well, once you get out there, I guess, you start feeling good about yourself and yeah. the things you do. Um, you said on TikTok you gained a bit of a following. When you first told me, I was like, no, nah, there's no way. But I went onto your profile. People, like, it's because yeah. you're real. It's because yeah. you're real about what happened and it's yeah. a real story. Yeah. You're not trying to be fake on there. Yeah. Uh, you got You got that following... You go live a lot. Yeah. You, know, you tell lots of stories. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your TikTok about? And what's what's the journey there? I know with the, with the rewards you get through like live and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you, battling. You give that back to the, to the yeah, homeless. Yeah, so. And, and what's that? That's a, the, the leg up program? Yeah, that's the leg up program. I forgot to change that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's called the leg up program. So, I... I just, we run this program called the Leg Up Program. So every Monday night I do battles on TikTok, yep. uh, which is cash reward. And all of that money that I get out of that, we put that back into the Leg Up Program. And then we go down, we give out clothing, we give out gift cards. We're, what it basically is, is I sit down with them and I buy them breakfast and we have a conversation about their lives. And I share with them mine. Well, not my whole story, but I just say, you know, I was on them streets, bro. I was a heroin addict. I went through all this stuff and there's a way out, man. Let, let me show you the path, way out, mm. you know. And, mate... I'll speak to 100 people and we might only get four or five results. But it, one result, Brandon, is a result. You know, like we can just get one person. Like we've got one young guy now who's travelling around the country doing bean picking and veggies. You know, another guy we just got a guitar for who's busking now on the streets. And like, you know, the, there's some success, Yeah. you know, and um, and it's beautiful. They love us. We love them. It's it's amazing. And you've been doing that every every week? Every you? week, yeah. Every, every Tuesday. Week? Yeah, every Tuesday I go down uh, at six in the morning and I leave and we get home about four or five and it's just... We, I enjoy it and I've, as you know Frankie's been helping me as well because I need a woman and, as well like sometimes that a woman doesn't need a six foot three man still two whatever height I am standing above them covered in tattoos you know sharing so sometimes you need a woman who can sit down and um, interact with them from that perspective you know so it's perfect and your your partner's just here Frank Frankie did you just say how long you've been with her for <laughs> two months but we keep two months dark. yeah yeah we have, we're not we're not sharing that online. Oh no. no! Oh no! <laughs> That's all right. He can Don't edit say that. anything. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I can edit. It's just that the, what it is is it's like we just we just love having each other. You know, we sort of met each other through this, just between you and I. Yeah. And um and yeah, just somehow we've connected, bro. And like we we really love each other in that way. You know, like just what we do and. We've just connected. It's only new. It's fresh, and um, and we just we just don't need to tell the world about it. You know, we just it's us. Yeah. 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 So scrap that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount, Mount's closed. That's that's good to hear, Glenn. Good, good to hear. You're happy. Um, I want to go back to your time in jail. Yeah. Uh, for, for a lot of people that listen, that they, they would not know what it's like inside there. Yeah. Tell me where you've been. Yep. Yeah. If there's any stories you've got oh. from inside the jail, they're meant to be correctional centres. Yeah. I know you've told me they're not. <laughs> no. So for. Fortunately or unfortunately, whichever the way you want to look at it, I grew up through institutions, right, and on the streets of the cross, which gave me some kind of 
leg up as I suppose when you went into jail because I knew a lot of people but jail's a whole different world bro you know I've been through Long Bay MRC CIP I've been through Bathurst Bathurst X-Wing Oberon Parramatta uh, I've been through quite a few of the jails and like jail's a different world it's a completely different world it's where you know like on the outside if you have an argument with someone you can walk away or you can go somewhere else in prison it's not like that in prison you got to front it you know what i mean and like someone said to me when i first got to jail he said don't stand tall just stand up you know so in other words don't walk around doing these ones just stand up you know and um and for me that worked you know like but I had to change who I was, Brandon, when I went to jail. I was doing weights every day, covering myself in ink. I was talking another language. Um, I became someone. But the h- hardest part of jail for me was when I got out, was changing back. Mm. Um, because you become, like you'll see, it, you, you, after a long time in prison, you become programmed almost. But, yeah, you see a lot of violence. Like, it's a violent world. I, I work in jails sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I was in area one of one jail yeah and that's like where the bad people go yeah yep. I, I can't even walk the streets without feeling nervous in this section i was just i could not ma- imagine being inside there i was like distant from them outside the gates cops everywhere like escorting me and yeah. i was still shitting my pants yeah right um the, the, the fact that you you go through it like I can't believe that. I see a lot of young guys come into jail. They've done something like a car. They've had a car accident. They've hit someone in a car. They've not brought up in that world. Yeah. For those people, as soon as I see them come in, I just feel a sadness about it. Because, I mean, for me, I grew up on the streets of the cross. I grew up in boys' homes like Derek. I grew up some really... My whole life was plagued with violence. Yeah. So I walked into a world I was familiar with. But for people who aren't familiar with violence... Um, it can be quite a, an adjustment to life, you know. Being, you get locked in maximum security. You spend 18 hours a day in your slot, you know, like in your cell. And it's the further you go down in classification. And because I was a, an SVO, which is a serious violence offender, it meant that I had to be in maximum security, and um, which meant I was with the most violent of men, you know, people that were in for serious long-time crimes. Lots of fights there? There like is. actual fights? Yeah, there is. And the fights with men are very savage. Like, they, they, very, they start over the most remote things. Most of them start over, over drug-related or over um, gambling. They're the two most common ones, or disrespect. You know, like, or something from the street comes up that happened and they bring it back in, you know, like something happened prior but, um, yeah, you do. And it can spur in a moment. Like, it's like the streets of the cross. You can be there in a moment and everyone's having a good time. And the next minute, it's whoosh, chaos. And it can be over the moment. I've seen someone playing cards one day and a guy um, was doing, like, signals, mucking around with his mate. Like, he thought it was funny. The other guy didn't. And, it, like, the next thing you know, it's, like, it's hectic. And you see people, you know, I've seen some really graphic things happen in prison. Yeah, real graphic. that's just a world I'm not used to at all. And um, I hope you never don't do. Yeah, well, <laughs> I hope I never do either. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess on to a lighter note, uh, you support the West Tigers. Unfortunately, I do. How's that been for the last few years? It's frustrating, Brandon. So I grew up with the Tigers my entire life, right? Balmain, that's my heart. And what I feel like, I feel sadness about West Tigers where they've like almost stolen their identity. You know, it's like they've created this new club and it's hard for me to adjust mm. to being a West Tiger supporter. Yeah. You know, West were the enemy. And like, just you know, like Fibros, I just, the Tigers were my thing, you know? And, um... 2015, I didn't really warm to it, even though we won the grand final. Was 2005. 10, five, sorry. Yeah, so yeah. 15, yeah, 2005 when we that had... West Tigers then? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's when they started. So it was just a couple of years after they started. Yeah. They were West Tigers, Benji Marshall and um, I think of the other half. Scott Scotty Prince. Prince. Yeah, yeah, Prince. Yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, I tried to get into it, but I'm struggling to. Like, I mean, I, my son goes for Tigers and I go for Tigers and I'm a very loyal person. Like, yeah. loyalty is my thing. So I can't let go of my Tigers. But, geez, I'm struggling with it, mate. <laughs> Does it feel like they're a different side completely to what you, what you grew up? Yeah, absolutely. Even the jumper, the jersey, you know. Like, I grew up with that Balmain, you yeah. know, Balmain boys, you know. And, like, my favourite era was the age, you know, with the blockers and the that, that era, you know, where we really had some success. And then I just watched them go down and down and down. And, like... To be fair, with the third-party agreements and the bigger clubs, the one city clubs, they're always going to excel. Um, but what I hated the most was the Tigers are one of the biggest supporters of junior league, and yet we seem to lose them the minute they get to the grade. <laughs> yeah. Like, they just get bought out from under us. Well, Bullet just extended, didn't he? Absolutely. And Jeezy yeah. had a good year. He, look, he's promising. And there are you look at that Tigers side, man for man, 
that forward pack's actually yeah. a, a formidable pack. Yeah. Uh, it's the spine. And, like, you look at the good sides like Melbourne, South, whatever, you look at their spines, you know, the Munsters and the Hughes and the Pappenhausens and the Grant. That's where they've invested their money. We're investing our money in second rowers, front rowers, and, you know, and then mm. cheaping in where it matters. Halfback, 5 8, you know, hooker and one. It's kind of like the Bulldogs, but I feel yeah. like the Tigers are in a little bit of better position because you've got Appy. Yeah. You've got um, Caesar and Sullivan coming and, yeah. and Buller, who's really promising. I think he's going to start slow next year, but I think he'll um, he'll come into his own eventually. Yeah, I like Appi and Buller. I, I, yeah. I like them both. Uh, Caesar, I'm, you know, I think for a year he'll be good until what, we've got some good juniors coming yeah. through. You know, so hopefully if some of them can make it to grey before Roosters buy them or someone else, uh, that would be nice. I think you look at the play, the teams like the Cowboys with Chad Townsend and yeah, Jamal yeah. Fogarty at the Raiders. I, th- I think Caesar's going to bring that. Yeah, yeah. Like being more experienced over in the Super League. Yeah. And all that. Um, the grand final just happened over the weekend. Is that the best grand final you've seen? Second best. Second best? What was the best? The Tigers won versus Canberra. I think that will go down as my favourite game. What was game. that, 1989? Yeah, 1989 grand final, 89? yeah, between Tigers and Canberra. Even though we lost that grand final, I thought that was probably... I mean, and you look at the players in that, Laurie Daly, Ricky Stewart, Steve Roach, like the, those two sides combined were Australia. That, like, pretty yeah. much, you know. And um, But, yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, Penrith's come back yesterday. I mean... You're a Penrith supporter, aren't you? I'm Manly supporter. Manly. I live in Penrith, so I'm very yeah, passionate same. about the yeah, vibes yeah. in the area. Yeah. So, look, I mean, it was a good comeback, bro. I thought yeah. they were gone. After he scored three in a row, Ezra Man, I thought that's, you know, that's unusual for the 5'8", specifically for that position, to score against the um, against that side. I actually thought Targo could be a problem yeah. with not playing so much footy. I think he was. Oh, he was. He was a problem. Yeah. I mean, he was not. He was lacking match fitness. He was moving up. He, he they weren't sliding the way he, they normally do. He was the, he was the error, and they yeah. ex- exploited him in that position. Um, but geez, to come back, and I said it to uh, Frankie. I said, if they only need one try, if they get that, Brisbane will panic, and it's exactly how it played out. Do you think, um, like a lot of people are saying, it's the best grand final they've ever seen? Do you think it's a bit of a recency bias? Like you, yep. you say, nineteen eighty nine was the best one you've ever seen. Uh, like I know myself, I'm thirty, and like that that's a, a grand final I never saw. Yeah, and yeah. Since since then, I'm just going off what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, do Do you think people overreact? Just with this sort of stuff, because it's all we've seen. I think it's one of the greatest comeback grand finals, you know? Yeah. Um, so they're looking at it from that perspective, absolutely. But, I, I, you know, there's been some really good ones over the years, you know? Like, I, even the one where Manly beat um, Storm, I thought that was incredible, because for all money, I thought Storm had that. And, uh, and for them to have lost so convincingly, you know? Yeah. And some of the ones between the Eels and the Bulldogs in the early 80s, they were yeah. some really good grand finals. Uh, the one with Royce Simmons, the Penrith one... 91. 91, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And Broncos, 92. Yeah, that's right. And um, I thought that was a good grand final. But yeah, it, it's up there. I'll I, I put it in the top five that I've seen. All right, just a game off the cuff quickly. What are, you, what are your top three NRL moments of all time? Oh, uh, Brad Fittler, when we were playing against England that time when we lost. I can't remember what happened, but he took an intercept and he um, passed it out to, was it Meninga? Might have been Meninga. I just know Brad Fittler moment there. Um, let me think. What, what's oh, that number? Number. I mean, oh, that'd be three. number three. Yeah, three. Number two. Um, number two would be the semi final against the Sharks when we got into the grand final eighty nine. Yep. Um, absolutely, yeah. And then our state of origin, the one where we won the th- um, the second game against uh, uh, Queensland, where we were on the three 0 sweep. I thought that game they were freaking class act. Where what year was that? 20, uh, it's not 2014, nine, was it? No, no, it's only three years ago, four years ago. Where, the one where Fritlow first takes oh, over. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and we won three in a so row. 2021. 2021, yeah. I mean, if I thought more harder, I'm probably sure I could find some games that were really good. But, geez, some Brad Fittler had some moments, mate. I, I think he is one of the best players I ever saw. And uh, I love watching Brad Fittler play. The, the Roy Simmons grand final was pretty well up there, too. You didn't put the Jonathan Thurston field goal for the Cowboys? No, I was at that game. So yeah. Tyrone and Joshua and I were actually at that yeah. game. And I I think that grand final's definitely up there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I don't like Brisbane or Queensland. So. Yeah, well, I think as a game, it probably wasn't, probably wasn't 
the best game. It was just the best finish. I think what happened in that game, in my opinion, and I said this in the grandstand when I was sitting with my boys, I said Brisbane are going to lose this game. And the reason why, the first half they played an attacky style of football, which was conducive to how they played their season. The second half, because they were leading, they went into a defensive mode where they were trying to defend the lead instead of continually to pile points on, right? And that's exactly how it played out. So the Cowboys are chasing, they're holding, and then finally they level out, and then he misses the goal and that you know takes them into the extras. But it was a good game. And look, JT, we, we all love JT. I was, yeah, I was pretty bored of the game actually until the end. Um, I, I think you're right there. Like I remember Andrew McCulloch kicking it out, like yeah, yeah. covering it. Yeah, out. yeah. And I, I want a Broncos to win that whole game. As soon as that happened, I'm like, okay, I hope they come back here because that's not how you close out a grand final. You just keep. Keep the foot on the pedal because it's yeah, never yeah. over till it's over. Yeah, you know, like one try is nothing in a grand final. I, I tell you what, I best I, like people always say Jared Hayne two thousand nine was the best um, run they've ever seen, but I, I I feel too better. I thought Tommy Turbo the year that we had the incredible points mm. in Supercoach where the whole rules changed, that was above and beyond anything I've ever seen, Brandon. Like his style of football and the way he played then he was just everything he touched turned to gold yeah you know and so some of those games i think were absolutely incredible that whole season through that was yeah and then i thought halen ponga this year yeah. and like i know a lot of people are filthy that he got the thing but mate you and i watched and we played super coach and, we, and like you had an incredible year actually you have two in a row you've done really well actually but um Kalen ponga this year mate he does things like i remember kando telling me at the thing we all went to that yeah. remember you were there you agree with me he said that um Heinze was a better player than Ponga and I said not any chance I mean in any in any way like I just don't see it I think we put a scenario up was if you put Hastings and Ponga at Cronulla versus yeah. Hines and Kennedy and Newcastle what side would do better absolutely and I think uh, Ponga with, at the Sharks with Hastings would absolutely kill it absolutely a lot more than than Hines does there and um I think he actually deserved to win the Daily M. Absolutely, me too. Sean Johnson, yes, he was the best player all year. But I also don't like this, oh, he's got other people taking points off him. Because yeah. I really feel like to be the best player all year, you've got to be the best player on the field for the majority of the games you're on the field. So it doesn't matter that Newcastle didn't have players taking points off him. Like, Kalen Ponga won, was influential in all these wins. Sean Johnson was not as influential I, in all these right. wins. That's right. You know, Aidan Fanua Blake had a, a, a stellar season. So did Charles Nickel Clockstead. There was a lot of um, different players. I've often thought that Dally M should be done like this, right? So they have positional. So number one for that season, you go the top. Like So for that round, go for the fullbacks. And it'd be like 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. 10, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For that round. So who was the best that way? And then do it per position. And I feel like if he was to do that... And then Dally M. Like, I don't know how it would play out, but I just feel like that would be a fairer uh, way of doing it. I don't hate that. I think yeah. I think the, the system that's there is probably the best at the moment, though. Yeah, like, and I don't... Because there's, there's flaws in that, right? Like, cause yeah, absolutely. Because the player can't win it if they've played 15 games. No, that's right. And, and, and people keep saying Ponga played so many less games and he's like, actually played 20 yeah. and Sean Johnson 23. But you, both, you you follow the chats, mate. Nobody writes more insane ideas in chats than I do. Like nobody, <laughs> surely. Yeah, you got some pretty rogue ones out there. <laughs> um, uh, just quickly before we finish up, uh, the, the mortar chats going on at the moment because of Nathan Cleary's finish in the grand final. Um, what do you think the definition of an mortal is? And... The last intake, I think there was like seven players or something that went into that. Do you think that kind of stunted the um, the definition of an immortal because it was just so like it seemed very rogue? I think a few have been added that don't aren't deserved. And I look, I'm going to say this, and I know people probably laugh when I say, it, but Nathan Cleary is the best halfback I've ever seen, and I've been watching the game for over 50 years. Like he is the best, and like to have the most single influence on a game, Nathan Cleary is the best front-on defender I've ever seen. He he has every attribute covered as a half. He is an incredible footballer, and like yeah, they won by a chin, as we know, but <laughs> <laughs> it was it, like it, it, you. you you know, he's an incredible player. Like, yeah. I've never seen a halfback. Andrew Johns is the only other person who I put in the same scale mm. as uh, Cleary. And I and people are going to laugh when I say this one too. I reckon Cleary's better. I think that too. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. And, and I, I watched Joey. He was my favourite player. Me too. But you, you always think of the moments that the game's on the line and they pull off this ridiculous play. I remember Freddie 
uh, sorry, Joey doing a 40-20 in a moment in Origin. That yeah. Like, he, it was just so clutch. Yep. That was Cleary on the weekend. Yeah. Like, uh, ridiculous, and we've seen that from him. Uh, anything else coming up, Glenn, for, um, you know, your book, your your TikTok? What, what are the plans coming up in the future? So there are. So I'm writing another book at the moment called Escaping the Cross, uh, which I'm doing at the moment. So that's sort of a big deal. I, I've actually got another documentary possibly coming up as well. So I'm not sure how I'll wait until that comes up on Channel 7 possibly as well uh, from a different person though. Uh, yeah, so um, and, and I'm looking to expand on the stuff I'm doing on the streets, mate. I really want to um, take it to a new level. You know, I've got some big pods coming up over the weekend. Like I've, I, I've, I'm tucked into a lot of big contributors who are really you know follow me i'm also possibly doing an interview with a woman who runs she's got 190 something thousand followers 109 i can't remember which one it was on insta which is a harder place to get numbers mm. to catch a predator uh stuff that they do over there so i'm looking forward to that one as well mm. yeah i've got mate i'm i just keep moving forward bro and i'm going to keep doing it is this like your full-time thing is this like all your time's invested into it well, sort of. I Like you see, like I've kind of disengaged a little bit this year in Supercoach yeah. and you probably noticed because I've had so much going yeah. on. And um, and that's because, and it's been for my mental health, man. My mental health is in the best place it's ever been, Brandon. And it's because I've got out of myself and I'm helping others. You know, like in Narcotics Anonymous, which you're probably not familiar with, it says that the best therapeutic value for an addict is another addict. And it's also the same in life, you know, like... I, I feel like when other people talk and hear my story who are going through my journey and they say, like, this guy's been through shit, man. He's been through a heroin addiction. He's been through, you know, he's been through jail. He's mm -hmm. been through a lot. And if he can get up off his ass and start changing his life, then I've got no excuse to change mine, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I actually see you on TikTok live when, like, an important footy game's on. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what are you doing? You've got to be watching the footy. I do. I have it in the background. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, it's good that you've got um, that hobby and putting it all into it and giving back to yeah. people that need a day. Yeah. Just one last thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I was away. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I, I get so many messages, Brandon, from people. And one of the ones that I get a lot lately is, uh, hey, Glenn, I've been getting up off my lounge. I'm going to the gym. Hey, Glenn, I've been speaking to a counsellor and, and organised a mental health plan. Like, these things warm my heart, bro. And, like, my, my, my message is for the last 10 years, bro, who should I buy? Who should I sell? Yeah. That's been my <laughs> messages for years. What such and such is stats? Like, don't you know where our supercut stats are, bro? Yeah. All right, and I look at, you know, sharing and stuff. And it's like, and then, oh, bro, that play you told me to get, he did crap. And I'm like, bro, like, pick your own side. You know, like, I'll tell them nine that are good and one that's bad. And they don't <laughs> thank you for the nine that's good, right? They just thank you for the one that's bad. Not the best environment to be in if, no. you, if you're struggling with your mental Absolutely. health. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Especially that community is toxic, very toxic. And I, I used to think it was a good environment. It's not anymore. It can be. So yeah. the environment of tragics actually is. Yeah. Do you know that's one thing I will say? The whole of my tragics team have been aware of my mental health for some time. And there's a handful of them who literally ring me and check on me and say, hey, you okay? And